Okay, party people, we are ready to do another IXL. This is Portuguese and Spanish Expeditions Part 2. So if you're watching this, you want help doing the IXLs, eventually you'll want to try to do them on your own, but I'm more than happy to help walk you guys through them. And yeah, there you go. So let's get started. Oh, yeah. Remember, make sure you're logged in properly. You should have your name up here. You have to have your first last name, 333, and the co password I give you, if you saved it, it should pop up. But if you don't, it won't save your work. So please make sure you've done that. All right. So I'm assuming you've done part one. So this is taking off from there. You can see the timer, questions answered zero, timer, just two challenge one, there's two challenges and to get to the first challenge, you gotta get through five of six. While the Portuguese were working their way around the coast of Africa, European countries such as Spain also wanted to trade in the Indian Ocean. But Portugal already controlled the sea route along the West African coast. In fact, the rulers of Spain had signed a, agree a treaty agreeing not to trade there. Imagine you are the ruler of Spain. You are determined to trade in the Indian Ocean, but the Portuguese are blocking you from sending expeditions around Africa. What would be the best solution to the problem? Remember, these may be in a different order for you. Break the treaty and start an expensive war. Yeah, not so much. Give up and focus instead. Give up. Never give up. Guys, come on. Look for other routes to the Indian Ocean. Mm, that's what I would do. All right. Conflict and compromise. In the late 1400s, Spain and Portugal were tangled in multi multiple conflicts, both at home and overseas. At home, a war broke out over who should be the ruler of Spain. The king of Portugal had married the daughter of the former Spanish king, so he believed he had the right to rule Spain. However, Isabella I, who was the sister of the former Spanish king, insisted that she was the rightful ruler. Overseas, Portugal wanted to stop Spain from interfering with their territory and trade in Africa. The two powers came to a compromise in the Treaty of El Cacovas in 1479, which said the following, Isabella and her husband Ferdinand would rule over Spain. In return, Spain would get, not get in the way of any Portuguese trade in West Africa. After the treaty, Isabella, Isabella and Ferdinand had to keep their promise not to disturb Portuguese trade along the coast of Africa but they still wanted Spain to trade directly with Asia. So their only option was to look for a route to Asia that did not go around Africa. A man named Christopher Columbus, hmm, I've heard of him before, thought he could find another route to the Indian Ocean by sailing west across the Atlantic Ocean. But to do this, he needed someone to sponsor him and pay for his journey. Columbus asked the king of Portugal and the queen of Spain for money for his expedition. Match each monarch to the decision he or she made about funding or paying for Columbus's expedition. So what would the king of Portugal say versus what the queen of Spain would say? Experts say this voyage will take much longer than Columbus thinks and the Portuguese navigators are close to finding a route to Asia around Africa. It doesn't make sense to spend money on this voyage too. Wow, who would say that? I'd say the King of Portugal. My guess, remember they may be in a different order. There are some doubts about Columbus measurements, but if he succeeds in getting to Asia, we could compete with Portugal's growing wealth. So I would agree to fund him. Oh, Portugal can't compete with Portugal, so that's got to be the Queen of Spain. So let's see. Hey, oh, got two. Four more to go. All right, keep it up. 
what was wrong with Columbus's measurements? Columbus measured the distance around the Earth at the equator to be 20,400 miles. His measurements were based on estimates from texts that were hundreds of years old. Mass scholars during Columbus's time thought Columbus was wrong for two reasons. They estimated that the distance between the lines of longitude at the equator was actually 60 miles. That made the distance around the Earth closer to 21,600 miles. They also believed that the Asian continent was smaller than Columbus thought, so it didn't extend as far across the ocean. By their measurements, the ocean between Europe and Asia was too vast for European ships to cross. Mass scholars of the time were right to think that Columbus's measurements were wrong. However, their measurements weren't correct either. The actual distance around the Earth at the equator is around 24,874 miles. I know this because I walked it once. Not. Okay. In August of 1492, Columbus set sail, traveling west across the Atlantic Ocean with three ships. Columbus kept detailed notes in a journal to share with the Queen Isabella when he returned to Spain. Remember, she sponsored him. Read the passage from Columbus's journal. Oh, that means it's a primary source, original source document, guys. 10th of the September. On this day and night, I sailed 60 leagues, a unit of measuring distance, but I only reckoned or counted 48 leagues to the crew, so the men would not be alarmed that the voyage seemed too long. Hmm. Based on the passage, what can you learn about Columbus's first voyage, select two? Now these are maybe in a different order for you. Columbus measurements were correct. Yeah, I don't know if that says anything about that. Columbus crew had complete confidence in his captain. Well, if he's got a lie to them, because I don't know. Columbus expected his voyage to be shorter than it was. Hmm, I only reckoned it 48, so the men would not be alarmed. Uh, yeah, I think that might be it. Columbus was worried about telling the crew how far he went. Yeah, so it was a lot longer than he thought it would be, and the crew was starting to panic and revolt. They, didn't, they might throw him overboard. All right, remember, it might not be your bottom two. Let's see what we got. Hey, okay, mutiny, which is an overthrow or a rebellion. Mutiny on board the Santa Maria. The Santa Maria, I love saying that was one of three ships on Columbus's voyage. After sailing more than two months, some of the Santa Maria's crew members were worried about how long they had been at sea. On October 10th, 1492, they attempted a mutiny or rebellion against the captain. They tried to force the ship to turn back to Spain. Fortunately for Columbus, the mutiny was stopped and someone spotted land just three days later. Whew. Look at the map of Columbus's journey The follow the instructions below. Okay, so remember that's Portugal, Spain, Europe's up here, Africa. He thinks he can sail west and come over here to Asia. But he runs into this thing called the Americas. Right. When Christopher Columbus reached land after two months at sea, he was, where was he? The Pacific Ocean? No. The Atlantic Ocean? Well, he was in the Atlantic Ocean, but he hit land, so that, I don't think that, he was in Native Americas, I hope not. Yeah, Indians, the America, he was in the Americas, right? So this North and South America, he was in the Americas. However, he believed he accomplished his goal of sailing across the Atlantic to reach India. And he would have if the Americas weren't there. He would have went around and came over here. He began calling the people who lived there Native Americans to be PC. No, Indians, because he thought he was in India. 
Remember, it may not be that order for you. Let's see if we got it. Come on, big bucks. Submit. Hey. Who were the people Columbus encountered? Columbus's crew landed in the Caribbean islands, home to the Taino Native Americans. The Taino people lived in different chiefdoms, which are networks of small groups with one main leader. The Taino chiefdoms were linked to each other by similar languages and culture. Historians are not sure how many Taino people were there when Columbus arrived in the Caribbean, but some estimates some estimate that the largest island of Hispaniola alone, the Taino population was high as 750,000 people. What was their society like? Chiefdoms were divided into social classes of common people and more powerful people. They were led by chiefs called caciques. Taino people lived in spirits called zimis that represented the cycle of life day-to-day -day affairs or important crops such as the cavasa root. The Taino people had their own style of pottery. They crafted figurines and elaborately decorated ceramic bowls. Some rich Taino people wore jewelry made of gold, which attracted Columbus's interest. Remember the three Gs, gold, God, and glory. That's one of them. Taino people traced their ancestry through their mother instead of the father, which is a matrilineal society. No vocab word. Continue. All right. Look, we're getting there, guys. Almost there. Columbus and his crew found land they had reached was home to a large number of people. These people belonged to the group of Native American societies known as the Taino. Read some of those Columbus's journal entries about his encounters with the Taino people. So again, primary source, this is what he's saying. 11th October, it appears to me that the people would be good servants. And I am in their opinion that they would very readily become Christians. Ooh, one of the G's, God. As they appear to have no religion. Well, they did, but he just didn't understand it. If it please our Lord, I intend at my return to carry home six of them to your highness. What, you're gonna bring six of them back with you? It's sort of like stealing them. Hmm. 14th of October. The people I hear are simple in warlike matters. I could conquer the, all of them with 50 men and govern them as I pleased. What kind of talk is that? Conquer them? 21st of October. I shall sail around the island until I succeed in meeting with the king in order to see if I can acquire any gold, which I hear he possesses. Okay, so we got two of the G's here. God, make them Christian, gold, steal their gold. In glory, we have Columbus Day to this day. Okay, what is true about Columbus's attitude towards the Taino people he encountered? Select three that apply. Remember, these might be in a different order for you. He assumed they would want to convert to Christianity. Yeah, because they're saying they were, oh, they didn't have a God. I, I think they'll readily become Christians. No. He respected their authority over land. Let me see. Uh, I can take six of them back. I could conquer them and govern them as I, no, it's not respecting them. He could believe he could take gold from them. Yeah. And then go to see if I can get any gold, which I hear they possess. He wanted to capture some of them to be servants. Yeah, I'm going to take six of them home with you and give them to you. And they're simple. I can conquer them and govern them as I please. So I'm going to make them slaves. Columbus Day. Well, why don't we celebrate that? All right. Changing goals from trade to settlement. Columbus returned to Spain, but only a few months later, he set out on his second voyage to the Caribbean. This time his goal was in trade. Instead, he brought 17 ships full of enough people and supplies to establish a colony or a settlement. His goal was to begin growing valuable crops and mining for gold to send back to Spain. What would become of the Taino people in Columbus's new colony? 
As his journal entries show, Columbus believed he had the right to conquer and enslave the people he met in the Caribbean islands. When the Taino people finally fought back against Spanish rule, Columbus's men responded violently. What? Why do we celebrate this guy every year? In many places across the world, people have built monuments honoring Columbus's voyage to the Americas. Look at the images of some of these monuments and complete the sentence below. Rhode Island, there's Columbus looking real historic, you know, heroic, heroic, like a hero. Oh, there's another one in Argentina. Wow, he's up there, godlike. And in Spain, so in the Americas, in Argentina, and Spain, he looks pretty heroic and godlike, right? Complete the sentence. In this monument, Columbus is shown as blank and blank, violent and dangerous. No, I don't see none of that going on. Brave and heroic. Kind of looks that way to me. Weak and unimportant. Well, if he's weak and unimportant, they wouldn't have all these statues. So I would say brave and a heroic. He's a hero, right? Conquering and stealing people's land. Remember, they may be may not be the middle one for you. Let's see. Keep it up. Question is today, people are starting to think, was Columbus a hero? Mm. In the United States, Columbus is honored with statues and celebrated with a holiday, Columbus Day. Many people think of him as a brave explorer who voyages changed the world. However, some people disagree with this view. They think Columbus treated Native American people poorly, you know, enslaving them and killing them, kind of treat them bad. So he should not be seen as a hero. They have taken actions to challenge the way Columbus is remembered in the United States. In 1990, the state of South Dakota officially voted to celebrate Native American Day instead of Columbus Day. Hmm. In 1992, the city of Berkeley, California, renamed Columbus Day Indigenous Peoples Day. Many other cities and states have since done the same. What do you think about replacing Columbus Day? Hey, as long as I get my day off, you can call it whatever you want. Nah, seriously, I think it's a good idea to be Native American Day. What is collective memory? Collective memory is the way a group of people remembers a historical figure or event. Statues and holidays honoring Columbus show some of the ways that he's collectively remembered. So heroic, a hero, right? Even though he didn't do all that. All right, we're ready for stage two. Remember, this is a shorter one. There's only two stages. We gotta get five out of five correct. So far, it's taken us 15 minutes. Remember, you can pause this, come back to it anytime. And if you logged in, it's gonna save your work. So well done. All right. Columbus's voyage created a conflict between Portugal and Spain over who had the right to claim land in Africa and the Americas. <coughs> Excuse me. The two countries went to the Pope, an important religious leader, to resolve the conflict. The Pope was the head of the Catholic Church, the most powerful church at the time. Following the Pope's advice, Spain and Portugal agreed to the Treaty of Tordesillas in 1494. The treaty divided the world along the line of longitude and set the following rules. So basically they make this imaginary line and they make rules about it. Spain could claim any land west of this line. Remember, never eat shredded wheat. So any of this land's land could be Spain's. Portugal had the right to claim all lands east of this line. So all the land over here go to Portugal. Doesn't matter what the people already living there want to say, it's what they're saying they can do. Okay, look at the map and follow the instructions below. Let's see. This is a better map to show. Remember, he wanted to sail west to reach the New World or the, reach China and India. So if he didn't hit the New World, he would have succeeded. 
Okay. Now, to each group or society with the way its leader may have felt about the Treaty of Tordesillas. All right. I don't like this treaty because it gives Portugal the right to take land from my kingdom. Who would say that? England? No, not really. Portugal? Portugal is going to take land from themselves. Native Americans? No, because Portugal can't go over there. Kingdom of Congo. Remember, Portugal at this time is trying to get its inroads in Africa. They tried to invade, but African leaders were too powerful. So yeah, Kingdom of Congo. We saw this in the video. The treaty is good for me because it gives my country right to claim most of the Americas. Well, who got that? Remember, anything west of the line went to Spain. So Spain would say, hey, I'm, I'm good with it. I like this treaty because it gives me the right to claim all of Africa for my country. Doesn't matter what Africa has to say about it, but that would be Portugal because they are on this side. Even And they tried, but they weren't able to conquer Africa because the African kings kicked their butts. So they set up trading posts instead. The treaty is bad for us because it says that Spain has the right to claim our lands as its own. So Spain gets all this land. Who would say that? Native Americans. And I am frustrated because I want to claim new land for my country, but the treaty does not leave any for me. Mm. Oh, England's the only one left. And yeah, they want, they're eventually going to settle up here and form what we live in now, the United States. All right. Remember, they might not be in the same order for you, but let's see what we got. So make sure you match the answers correctly. Hey, what about that? Who was affected by the Treaty of Tordesillas? After 1494, the, the rulers of both Spain and Portugal believed they had the right to claim and conquer all four lands that the treaty gave them. As a result, the Spanish established colonies in the Americas and the Portuguese tr traded enslaved people in West Africa. One of African ruler, King Alfonso, remember him from the video? Of the Kingdom of Congo wanted to stop the Portuguese slave trade. Well, he wanted to stop it from his people, but he didn't mind it from other tribes that he was conquering. So remember, Portuguese were playing them against each other. You know, I'll get slaves from you who's conquering this other one and this other place will get slaves from here. And this guy's like, no, no, I'll sell you slaves, but not, not my people. Okay, so another primary source. Merchants are taking every day our natives, sons of the land, of the land and sons of our noblemen. So great, sir, is the corruption and wickedness that our country is becoming depopulated and your highness should not agree with this. It is our will that the kingdoms, there should not be any trade or slave outlet for them. Mm, interesting. Because he was taking part of it. Remember he trade, he converted to Christianity, Catholicism. We saw a lot about him in the video. Okay. So again, Portugal, would love nothing more than to conquer and steal these slaves, but they can't because the kings are too powerful to do so. Okay, we got to the second challenge, second stage of the second challenge. After Spain and Portugal signed the Treaty of Tordesillas, Spain was able to continue sending expeditions west. In 1513, the Spaniard Vasco Nunez Balboa became the first European to reach the Pacific Ocean by traveling west. 
Asia was on the other side of the Pacific Ocean. By fighting the Pacific Ocean, Balboa proved that Columbus had not landed in Asia, but another continent entirely. The map shows Balboa's route to the Pacific Ocean. Look at the map and answer the questions. So again, sailing from Spain. Uh, there's actually land here, so he must have, it's a very narrow land and he crossed over and found the Pacific Ocean. This is where we built the Panama Canal many hundreds of years later. And you can sail boats through there now because it's relatively narrow. So he did find the Pacific Ocean, but you couldn't really sail through there. You'd have to sail around South America. So why was Balboa's, isn't that rocky? Hey, Adrian, yo. Why was Balboa's arrival in the Pacific Ocean important? Balboa's voyage proved that Columbus had been correct in saying he found India. Well, no, it proved him wrong. Balboa showed that it was still possible for Europeans to each reach Asia by traveling west. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, take a long time, so that might be it. Balboa showed that sailing west across the Pacific Ocean was too dangerous. No, I never really said that. And Balboa's voyages were the first expedition to reach the mainland of the Americas. No, they're still just hitting these islands and this little South America peninsula. So we're going to say Balboa showed it was still possible to reach Asia by traveling west. Yeah, let's see. Survey says, ding, ding, ding. A whole new world. In the early 1500s, Europeans were beginning to realize that Christopher Columbus had not landed in Asia. Duh. In 1503, an Italian man named Amerigo Vespucci wrote a letter describing a voyage he made across the Atlantic in 1497. Primary source alert. As Pussy wrote, it's lawful to call it a new world because none of the countries were known to our ancestors. As Pussy's term new world caught on. As a result, these new lands were named after him, the Americas. Yeah, but what about the people already living there? Yeah, never mind. Unreliable sources. Although Vespucci did eventually travel to the New World in 1497, his, his 1497 expedition never actually happened. What? Many of the other details in the letter were false as well. Historians use sources such as letters to learn details about events in the past. Because sources such as Vespucci's letter might not be true, it's important for historians to read many different sources. Oh, yeah, it's kind of like we spent the first five weeks talking about historical thinking. Hmm, I wonder why I did that. It's important to consider the source. It might not be true. All right. In 1522, a Spanish navigator named Ferdinand Magellan led the first expedition to successfully circumnavigate or sail around the earth. Look at the map of the expedition's route and follow the instructions below. So we left from Spain. Remember, can't get through there. You gotta go around South America. Comes up over in Pacific. Hey, I'm in Asia, just like Columbus thought he was. Back to Spain. So remember, the Portuguese are going around Africa this way. Columbus wanted to sail straight across, which Magellan kind of did, going around South America. And Columbus still swore he reached Asia on his dying day. The table shows the results of Magellan's expedition, match the result to his effect on Spain in Europe. All right, Spanish people who came in contact with people living along the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, so Spanish people are coming in contact with all these different people. So Spanish people bought knowledge about other countries, cultures to Europe, that could be it. Spain became much wealthier from other European countries who trade. Yeah, that could be it too. 
other European countries became more interested in sending expeditions towards America? Nah, I think it's one of those two. Spanish people started trading goods between the Americas and Asia. Okay, so that's got to be the wealthy one. Makes them rich. Other Europeans realized they could reach Asia by sailing past the Americas. Oh, so other European countries became more interested in expeditions. So I think that one goes there. Spanish people bought knowledge about other countries and cultures to Europe because they're meeting all these different people. They're saying, hey, did you know they could do this over here? And they're bringing back new ideas. An ill-fated explorer. Although Ferdinand Magellan's ship successfully circumnavigated the Earth and returned to Spain, Magellan himself did not return with the rest of his crew. Uh -huh. Magellan, ca captain of the expedition, died before he could reach his voyage, complete his voyage. <coughs> Excuse me. Magellan and his crew spent three weeks in the Philippine Islands. During this time, Magellan became involved in a conflict between two local rulers. Magellan and his crew took part in an attack against one of the rulers, and Magellan was killed in the fighting. Well, yeah, if you're going and attacking people, they might want to fight back. Even though they had lost their captains, the surviving crew members continued onward and made it home to Spain. Magellan's death helped show that European explorers did not discover empty worlds. Instead, they met, interacted with, and even sometimes defeated by other groups. All right, look at all this good stuff. Spanish and Portuguese expeditions sparked the first truly global era in world history. For the first time, people were able to trade across the Atlantic Ocean, creating connections between America, Europe, Asia, and Africa. This new global era of trade is known as the Columbian Exchange. It's a term you got to know. The map below shows some of the crops that were traded in the Columbian Exchange in the region of the world where the crops were first produced. Look at the map and follow the instructions below. All right, so tomatoes came from North America. So Italy, right here, never had any sauce for their pasta until they discovered the New World. Chili peppers and potatoes in South America. So Ireland is known for their potatoes, and yet they never had it to the Columbian Exchange. Coffee beans in Africa, Mr. Roush is known for his coffee, love of coffee, and he never would have had it to the ex Columbian Exchange. Grapes for wine, rice in China, right? So we didn't have rice in the Americas until it was brought over by the Columbian Exchange. So the Columbia Exchange is the exchange of goods and ideas between the worlds. So based on the map, decide whether or not each of the events below was possible before the Columbia Exchange. So spicing stew with chili peppers in India. So the chili peppers came from here. So no, it wasn't possible until there. Trading coffee for wine in a North African market. Well, wine and coffee. This one's a little tricky, but yeah, it had nothing to do with the Columbian Exchange because they still could trade it before the Columbian Exchange. Eating a bowl of steamed rice in China. Well, yeah, they already had it. So eating a bowl of steamed rice in North America, which Mr. Roush had last night, wouldn't have happened, so it is possible. Putting tomato sauce on pasta in Italy. Imagine that, no sauce on the pasta in Italy to the Columbian Exchange, not possible. Firing potatoes in Ireland, like I said, not possible. So all these goods were exchanged and brought from place to place, and now they're everywhere. Collectamundo. Italian food without tomatoes, ay caramba. 
The Columbian Exchange introduced Europe and Asia to many new crops, including potatoes, sweet potatoes, corn, tomatoes, chili peppers, chocolate. Mmm, me make gusta chocolate. Peanuts and pineapples. So Europe got all those from the New World. These new crops often added more nutrients and flavor to traditional European and Asian diets, and they became essential to many Euro Asian cuisines. If you go to a modern Italian restaurant, many of the items on the menu include tomatoes or tomato sauce. Before 1492, Italians did not know tomatoes existed. These images show traditional dishes from Italy, Ireland, and India. None were possible before the Columbian Exchange. What does it mean for food to be traditional? Well, that means it came from there. Growing sugar and coffee in the Americas. During the Columbian Exchange, Europeans also found that some crops from Europe, Asia, and Africa, such as sugar and coffee, could grow well in the Americas. As a result, Europeans began setting up large sugar and coffee farms in the Americas. These farms called plantations could make their owners a lot of money, but they also had some serious negative consequences for many non-Europeans. Uh-oh. So it's going to make Europe rich, but bring some problems to other people. So we look at a table. We got another question. The table below lists some of the actions of important Portuguese and Spanish expedition leaders. These actions were towards the people they encountered on their voyages. Look at the table and answer the questions below. So we have these leaders, Carbel, Da Gama, Columbus. We read earlier how this guy set fire to the merchant ships, killing 600 Muslim pilgrims. I'm sorry, that was the Gama. This guy killed some other merchants. Columbus took the Taino captive and forced the Taino ruler to give up his land and gold. Not a very nice guy. What do the actions of Carbala, de Gama, and Columbus suggest about the Portuguese and Spanish opinions about the people they encountered? Let's see. Portuguese and Spanish expeditions preferred peace over using violence. Well, I don't know, setting fire and capturing and burning and taking slaves. Yeah, I don't think so. Portuguese and Spanish expedition leaders respected the authority of foreign rulers. That doesn't sound like they respect them too much. Portugal and Spain believed that using violence was a good way to get what they wanted from foreign people. I'm thinking that might be the winner. And Portuguese and Spain did not want to create did not want to create conflict. They're burning and killing people and enslaving them. I think that causes conflict. So we're going to go with this one. Using violence was good, right? but not everyone agreed. This is my boy right here. As more Europeans traveled overseas, violent encounters with non-Europeans became more common. However, not everyone in Europe approved of this behavior. For example, Bartolome de la Casa was a Spanish man, actually a priest, who protested against the cruel treatment of non-Christians in America. La Casa thought that even though Native Americans were not Christians, Europeans did not have the right to enslave them and force them to become Christians. He has a point. La Casa wanted to spread Christianity, but he thought it could be done peacefully. The Casas was successful in ending Spanish violence in the Americas, was unsuccessful. However, he forced the Spanish government to think about the ethics or rules of right and wrong behavior overseas. This led some Spanish leaders to change the way they treated Native Americans. Not much, but a little bit. So he was a good man, the Casas. From Contact with foreign land, Europeans gained new knowledge, resources, and wealth. But European activity in America also had negative consequences for non-Europeans. Match the consequence to the European activity that caused it. 
So we got some bad, some European things here and some bad consequences. Europeans start farming with crops in the Americas, which require lots of workers. Okay. Native Americans often lost their land and were controlled by European governments. Yeah. Over 90% of Tiano Native Americans died from illness. Yeah. African people were captured and taken to the Americas for slave labor. Remember, we talked about that in the video <coughs> last week. And they discovered lands in the New World that really opened up the slave trade. <coughs> He wanted people to farm the land, but the Native Americans were killed by diseases. So Europeans carry diseases that people in the Americas had not encountered before, killing up to 90% of the Tainos over there. That's why they needed to bring in African workers, slaves, because the Taino who they enslaved were dying from the diseases. Europeans conquered territories and set up colonies. So that means Native Americans lost their land and were controlled by Europeans if they weren't killed. I mentioned that 90% of the Tayana were killed by diseases. Look at this picture here. This guy's coughing on him, spreading disease. They got all the little dots and stuff on him. It's just smallpox. Shortly after the Tayano people first found Spanish strangers at the shore, they began catching diseases from Spanish. Over time, Spanish people had built immunities or resistance to diseases such as smallpox and measles. But the people in the Americas had never encountered these diseases before, so their bodies weren't prepared to fight them. The first outbreak of new diseases hit the Caribbean island within five years after Columbus arrived. In just a few generations, smallpox and measles devastated the population. Many thousands of people inhabited the Caribbean islands by 1492. By 1548, barely 500 people were left. So it went from thousands and thousands to only 500 people. So most of them died from diseases. They were treated cruelly as slaves and killed. Hey, we mastered another skill, folks. We got a gold medal. We have a smart score of 100, right? That took us 39 minutes and two seconds. All right, folks. So good work. And we're going to log off. Thank you for following along.